the torrential rains of tropical Africa, will soon produce all the electricity Rhodesia will ever use. But first man must build a dam, the Kariba Dam, to hold back the waters of the mighty Zambezi. Waters which have poured over the Victoria Falls and given them the name of the smoke that thunders. Nature fought hard to avoid being controlled and for a time it seemed that nature would win as flood waters swept over foundations and carried away bridges. But the dam held and the waters rose irresistibly to leave thousands of animals marooned on ever dwindling islands. So was born Operation Noah's Ark, planned by the game department, helped by all and sundry, both black and white, and financed largely by funds collected here in Britain by the Fauna Society. Transport was the real headache. By the time the animals realized they were in trouble, the lake was already miles wide. Launches were brought in from everywhere, and the rescue teams make for the larger islands. The grassy plains along the river had been flooded early on and the animals driven into the more densely wooded hillocks. Trees aren't large by our standards, but sailing through even these treetops is slow and dangerous and it calls for special outboard motors, the kind they use in rivers full of weed. Not even these conditions can snarl up their props. Most of the snakes have disappeared by now but there's always a chance of coming face to face with an angry, hungry mamba, as green as the leaves which shelter and conceal it. Their accurate maps showed them just where to find dry spots, but the last bit of the journey has to be done the hard way, pulling the boats up until they beach. Then the nets can be set and the ropes prepared. These animals just can't realize what Operation Noah's Ark is all in aid of, and so they do their hardest to escape. There's the lumbering ant bear. There's antelopes of all sizes, but mostly the little chaps. There's a zebra or two and many others, and they make up as strange an army of comrades in distress as you can imagine. The floods were bad enough, and here's man to make things worse. How much easier it would all have been if only they'd cooperated. And there's no need to use a net for this extraordinary ant bear, or aardvark, if you prefer it. He's the world's fastest digger. Without the floods, you'd never see him at all. And even if you surprise him on the surface by day, he can dig himself out of sight while you watch. The warthog's an ugly brute. He's well armed too, and so they wisely put a muzzle on him to stop any further damage. With the water rising every day, this isn't the time for dignity. But it's actually far safer all round for the rescued antelopes and other animals to be trussed up firmly. They're less likely to overstrain themselves and to wreck their hearts. Even the small antelopes are fantastically strong. And their sharp edged hoofs could punch a hole straight through the bottom of most of their frail craft. Many of them were pushed off their grazing grounds days ago, and they're now so weak that they're past any serious resistance. The policy has got to be babies first. They're easier to catch and carry around. They're usually much more likely to survive than the older beasts that are set in their ways and almost untouchable. There aren't many of the larger animals left on this island. Some walked out while they could, while others managed to swim for it. And if only they knew which way to go, they'd be able to make it so much more easily. But this whole business is quite new to them, and the swimmers often flounder around 
hopelessly. Here's a cow kudu in difficulties. Maybe she could get through on her own, but it's safer and much quicker in the boat. This hydroelectric scheme began in 1955 with a survey of the area, so the wardens have their maps to work out just where the animals will concentrate. There's water everywhere, <laughs> but there'll be much more of it in four years' time. 2,000 square miles, in fact. A lake the size of Lancashire or Norfolk. It's a wonder that any of the small tree creatures like this bush baby ever survive at all. Stuck up in the treetops, they've been wide open to attack from hawks by day and owls by night. They may be wonderful jumpers, ten feet at a time if pressed, but this one's beyond jumping. Anyhow, th there's only water to jump into. And now they're off to a, a new island, if the outboard motor will start. It seems that Noah took everything with him, but this ark doesn't have a reptile house. They've got no room for puff adders. Is there no end to this job? Apparently not. These islands of Kariba will go on being made and then drowned for four more years. And for tortoises, this is the only way out. They might live for a while in water, but they could never swim out. And as for walking... They call him Stinker over in West Africa, but these rescuers had got stronger names for him. Near the root of the tail, this African civet cat keeps a gland that's the cause of the trouble. But believe it or not, there's a market for this scent, and somehow or other, it goes into some of the most exotic perfumes. By now, the worst is over for this little antelope. But it must be pretty far gone to accept such charity, even though it's a sweet biscuit. The map has shown them a bit of the shoreline where animals are unlikely to be cut off again. And here's a boatload on its way to safety. But you can't pass by an animal in need, and so yet another kudu has to be taken in tow. Again, it's a cow. In this antelope, only the bull has horns, and they're the longest in the world with a record of just six feet around the curves. Kudus are the most inoffensive antelopes imaginable. But you can't blame it for resisting arrest, or shall we say, being taken into protective custody. That striped coat may be obvious enough to close up, but in the dappled light and shade of the woodlands, it just melts into the background. The southern Rhodesian government has established two special sanctuaries towards which the boats shepherd the swimmers and transport the rescued. But over here on the north bank, Colonel Critchley and his helpers seek out the safest spots, and they wish their passengers farewell. First, they release the tiny antelopes. The bushbuck, clipspringers, dictics, orabies, and the rest. they speed them noisily on their way before they get ready to release the warthogs. And here they are making a break for it. What on earth did they put in that sack? Why, it's an old stinker, uncooperative to the bitter end. Well, nearly the end, when he realises he's only been taken for a joyride. And finally, they get the kudu ashore. Some 2,000 head have been ferried to freedom so far, but Operation Noah's Ark has barely started. What a pity the Ark wasn't ready earlier. 